All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, my name is uh, Declan Kunkel. I'm an undergraduate student here at Yale, and I'd like to welcome you to What Can European History Teach Us About Trump's America? So I'll let you know tonight that the lecture is being recorded, so there's no need for you to do that. It'll be posted on YouTube after the fact. The Yale Political Union, the European Studies Council, and myself are very proud to welcome uh, Professor Timothy Snyder, the author of Black Earth, the Holocaust as History and Warning. Um, as a student in one of Professor Snyder's classes, uh, I can assure you that we're all in for a treat tonight. If you could hold your questions till the end, uh, there'll be a question and answer session. Since this is an event mostly for undergraduates, um, we will be favoring questions for undergraduates and microphones will be passed around. So thank you very much and enjoy the talk. Could you, Declan, could you mute that one? So if I just, if I just blast it out, can you hear me? Does yeah. that work? Okay. Um, so what, what I want to do in, in the next hour or so is, is share with you an idea about history and politics. It's really just one idea. Um, the idea is that history has to be political. If I get that idea across, then what I will try to do is give you a sense of how the 20th century might just be useful for the century that all of you, or most of you, um, will, be, will be confronting. So let me begin at the beginning with what seems really simple, but, but it's not. And that is, the, that is the question of how history is political, how history has to be political. I'm going to say some things which will seem so simple that they'd be more appropriate for elementary school, but it's been Actually, I shouldn't talk down elementary school because like when I, when I go to my kid's first grade parent-teacher orientation and I listen to his teaching philosophy, the first grade teachers, I was like, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty <laughs> much mine. <laughs> he's, a, he's a little more eloquent. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't, talk down, shouldn't talk down elementary school. But the point is that some things that are very simple I think have been forgotten. So history. To have history, you have to have a sense of time with the past, right? A past which is complex, which is composed of moments, um, a present where things are somehow related to that past, but many things are still possible, and a future which is indeterminate, but which has something to do with that past. Now, if you accept these premises, the idea that time flows forward, that things are indeterminate but nevertheless inexplicable, that there are moments we can concentrate on and try to understand, then you're thinking historically. Now, why, why would I claim that this is somehow political? Well, for one thing, if you think historically, insofar as you think historically, you have a political imagination, right? If you know about the past, you know that various things happened, right? And to know that something happened is to know that it was possible. And to know that something is possible, to actually see it in your mind's eye, is to have imagination. And more, if you really understand a moment of the past, any moment of the past, you know that that past moment contains not just what did happen, but all the things that might have happened, right? And insofar as you can imagine those things, you've also developed a political imagination. And once you do that, and then cast your gaze on the present and on the future, you will be more suspicious of ideas which say, it has to be this way, it has to be that way, right? You'll be suspicious of every monism. You'll be suspicious of every determinism which suggests to you that things have to be a certain way. Now, um, another thing which is extraordinarily nice about history is that, and this is again very conventional, right? So just nod and humor me. It means that nothing is entirely old. There is only one history, right? I mean, since writing began and people began to contemplate written sources and try to make sense of them and put them together, there has only been one history. We just have one history. Everything is in some sense connected, even if we don't see all of the connections, which means that nothing is entirely old, right? Everything which is in the past is somehow related to the present. The comforting part about that, the comforting part, the rooting part, the grounding part about that is that nothing is entirely new either, 
right? Which isn't to say that history repeats because it doesn't, it doesn't even rhyme, although, you know, in general, Mark Twain's a genius. It doesn't even rhyme, but nothing is entirely new, right? If you think historically, you can never be completely surprised. I mean, you can be surprised by certain things, right? Like, I'm surprised sometimes by what people wear in office hours early in the morning, but I'm <laughs> never completely surprised, <laughs> right? Because I know that the history of nudity is old, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm never completely surprised, right? You can, <laughs> so much less blushing than there should be, really. I, I mean, in all fairness, all right. So, but so nothing is entire, so you can never be completely surprised. There's always a bit of you which says, aha, okay, I'm shocked, but that reminds me of this, okay? I'm surprised, but I see, I see a certain, I see a certain pattern, right? So no nothing is entirely new. Now, I, I hope that what I've said thus far is uncontroversial and sensible um, and legible, you know, at least to those of you who, who, who are working with me together to do history. But what I next want to point out is that there are other ways to think about time, other really powerful ways to think about time, ahistorical or rather anti-historical ways to think about time. And as I describe them, I, I want you to see how familiar they are and how they impinge upon your lives, how they're in fact present all of the time. One of them is what I would call the politics of inevitability. And this is so close to us, so close to my generation, but also to yours, even closer to yours, that it somehow it's, it can be difficult to extract oneself from it. What's the politics of inevitability? The politics of inevitability looks, it looks a little bit like history. It has a sense of the past, it has a sense of the present, it has a sense of the future. Time moves forward, but in the politics of inevitability, we know where time is moving. Right? We know where it's going to end up. We're confident where it's going to end up. Right? In the case of the politics of inevitability, which has afflicted us in the West, and in particular the United States in the last 25 years or so, the notion is it's all going to sort itself out into liberal democracy one way or the other. Right? So, I mean, the, the sort of trademark of this, ver of this notion was the end of history. Right? So all that's left is liberal democracy. We don't have any other ideas this is such a fallacy. We have no other ideas, therefore history must be moving towards liberal democracy. Okay, it sounds ridiculous when I put it that way, but that's been your whole life, right? <laughs> that's been your whole life up to now, right? That's the politics of inevitability feels like history, it looks like history, smart people can defend it as history and, and have done so, right? But what is it in fact, or what was it in fact? Let me try to historicize it. Historically, it was the replacement of one teleology by another, right? Telos just means goal. A teleology is a view of time which says that it's all moving towards one goal, right? So in 1989 to 1991, what tended to happen among very smart people in this, t in this part of the world was that they said, okay, the story of communism is not true. There's not an inevitable socialist revolution. There's not an inevitable communist utopia. Therefore, and this is where this is the big mistake, right? You, you see it coming. <coughs> Therefore, another story is true, right? And that other story is the one about liberal democracy. Now, admittedly, the, the advocates of liberal democracy were neither as well-dressed, flashy, or prone to die young as the advocates of communism, <laughs> right? And so they kind of slipped in under the radar of theoretical critique a little bit, right? Um, but nevertheless, this is also a teleology. The mistake is to say one teleology is wrong, therefore another teleology is correct, right? That's, that's the fundamental mistake. Now, the, and, and so what, what follows, why is this not historical thinking, right? Be it's not historical thinking because in this way of seeing the world, since you know what's going to happen in the future, roughly, I mean, you don't know exactly when or how, but you know that roughly we're all, you know, the arc of history is, there is no arc of history, right? There's no arc of history, no arc. Y if you think you, sorry, there is no, there isn't, right? Who's wrong? Um, it doesn't bend either, because it's not an arc, <laughs> and you know, and justice is up to you, right? So, so the mistake is if you think you know where history is going, then you don't have to know anything about the past, right? Or the, the few things that you know about the past, you can just work into the story of how it has to end up in that particular future, right? So actually you don't need 
history, right? You can have knowing nods about certain things in the past, but you don't really need history because you don't need imagination. You don't need possibility because you already have a certain conviction about where things are going. Now, what are the, what are the reactions to this or what are, the, what are the syndromes associated with this? And I'm going to list some things which I imagine you have experienced in your own lives, right? And I will try to avoid like embarrassing pop culture references which date me while I do this, but I can't guarantee you that I will succeed. Paranoia, right? Paranoia, because if there's only one way that things can go in the future, then there's a certain tendency to say, aha, there's a master plan, there's a conspiracy, right? We have to get out from under it. Okay, first embarrassing pop cultural reference. This is the matrix view of history, right? The ma you, go to, you, you, know, you go to work, there's a cubicle, you're dressed up, more or less like I'm dressed up, right? But then it turns out there's a <coughs> secret reality underneath it. That's a reaction to this way of seeing the world. Like if there's only one story, you think, oh wait, there should be a counter story, right? And it should, ideally it should involve carrying in moss, leather, special effects, really slow bullets. Okay, I promise that will be the last embarrassing pop culture. No, I don't actually promise that. Second, um, second reaction, political boredom. Okay? The Germans have a good word for this because they have a good word for everything, because they have an amazing language, Alt alternative Losigkeit, right? <laughs> the absence of alternatives, this is a name for this, this is a name for the politics of inevitability, a name for a syndrome, the syndrome of boredom. If you accept that there are no alternatives, right, the politics of no alternatives, if you accept that there are no alternatives, politics becomes unbelievably boring because what happens is in the two-party system, one party becomes the party of the status quo that has to be. And then the other party becomes the party of um, fancy, crazy, rebellious, system-destroying ideas, right? Which aren't particularly articulate and they don't have to be, right? So that's the story of the United States, right? It's also the story to a great deal of, content, of continent politics in continental Europe, although there it's often two centrist parties are the ones who say no alternative to the status quo, and then you have a populist right-wing party which says system destroying, you know, free thinking, all kinds of stuff, right? So politics becomes very boring if you know where things are, are going. A, a, a word that people have used a lot for this, right, in English is neoliberalism. Okay, neoliberalism, it's bad, yeah, okay. The problem with using neoliberalism is that it embraces everything, right? It's a, it's a word of critique which actually fails completely to critique because it means everything, right? And when people say neoliberalism, they basically mean, they mean the lack of alternatives, but they mean they don't like the lack of alternatives, but they're not usually providing an alternative. Usually the word neoliberalism is meant as a kind of gesture of helplessness, right? As soon as you say neoliberalism, all the air goes out of the room because you're just kind of admitting there's no alternative to it, right? That's just it. It embraces, it embraces everything, which leads to other reactions. Like, tell me, you know, just nod, please humor me, nod. Discursiveness, right? Now you're already nodding, I haven't even said anything. Um, <laughs> she also sits in the front row in class, right? <laughs> She's totally reliable, <laughs> laughs at all the jokes. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know her name, so there are no grading issues here, right? Um, so, um, okay. So, um, discursiveness. If you can't talk about the what, right? If you already know what the what is, the what can't change, then you only, you only talk about the how, right? You describe, you skate along the surface, you, skin, you skim along, you know, you describe these superficial things. Um, and, and, and the extreme of discursiveness comes that thing called irony, right? Irony, knowing irony, right? The wink and the nod, the critique which is not a critique, because again, it doesn't actually provide an alternative. Irony refers to that broad set of things which we all think we know and we nod our heads about it, but what are those things exactly, right? What happens in irony is just the reinforcement of the status quo. Disruption, a word which I hope never ever to hear again, but will because Steve Bannon is, is the, he uses that word a lot. Disruption, right? What's the idea of disruption? Disruption means we're gonna come along and disrupt, right? What's the premise of disrupting? The premise is there's a system which will automatically rebound. No matter how obnoxious we are, how young we are, how anti-systemic we are, we can disrupt and that will be cool. But the assumption of this is that there's a system which will bounce back, right? But what if there isn't? <laughs> what if there isn't a system which will bounce back? What if the notion of disruption, disruption is entirely empty, 
right? Then, then where are we? Well, basically we are where we are now, where we have a disruptor in chief, right, in, in, in the White House. Okay. Who is going to, who brings things back after disruption? Who is going to bring things back after this particular disruption, right? I'm looking at you and I'm nodding because it's going to be you or nobody. The big problem, nervous laughter, the big problem, <laughs> The big problem with, with the politics of inevitability is that it's very vulnerable to shocks. Because if anything happens of significance, then the scheme seems not to work. People's knees shake, their voices shake, they don't know how to interpret something like September 11, 2001. Right? Because it doesn't fit into a story like this. And since it doesn't fit into a story, and because you've taught yourself that the pa actual past doesn't matter, then when there's a shock like this, you simply say, everything is new, right? And everything is new is just a baby step away from everything is permitted. So this already happened to us once in 2001. I'm going to suggest it's very likely to happen to us again. I'll get to that, I'll get to that later on. But the, the fundamental problem of this, of, of the politics of inevitability, is that it, it itself seems inevitable until it collapses, right? And it can, right? And it will, and it just has. It just has, right? That's, that's over. So the question is, what comes next? There's another way of thinking about time, another ahistorical, another anti-historical way of thinking about time. And you know, to give away the game at the outset, the risk is, for you, for me, for all of us, for, for America, the West, the world, the risk is that we, we shift from a politics of inevitability, right, where, where time moves forward in a straight line, to a, a, a politics of eternity, right? Where you, you, you seem to have, you see, again, this seems to be historical, but, but it's not. What's the politics of eternity? Um, the politics of eternity, it, it, it pantomimes history by referring to the past, but by never quite putting anything in order, never quite explaining anything. It works in concepts like memory, right? Memory in the 21st century being a name for something which no one actually remembers personally, right? Um, commemoration it works under that name as, as well. Um, uh, it, 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 it works by ensconcing certain things that happened in the past in a kind of insecure chronology where basically kind of everything happened at the same time. You know, in the last thousand years or 200 years or 100 years, however old your country happens to be, you think it is, everything roughly happens at the same time. Its key emotion is nostalgia, but it's nostalgia for things that never happened, right? This is the beautiful bait and switch of the politics of eternity. You are meant to be nostalgic all the time, but none of the things you're nostalgic for ever actually took place. And so you're drawn in again and again and again into the abyss. So specifically, right, if Russia builds a monument to uh, Prince Vladimir in Moscow, right, where he never lived, where he never could have lived because the city didn't exist at the time when he was alive, right, um, it, not to mention like all the personal flaws of, King, of, of Prince Vladimir, I'm just going to leave those completely aside for like an extra credit question on the exam. But when, when you do make a move, when you make a move like that, Right? Or if you're Poland, or France for that matter, or Britain even, and you imagine an, an interwar period, a 1920s or 1930s, when there was a nation state, okay, France and Britain have never been nation states, which is why the nostalgia of Brexit is a nostalgia for nothing. France has never been a nation state. It was an empire, and then it folded into a European integration project. It has never been a nation state. When the Front National talks about a France before interaction with the world, there never was such a place. You're being asked to be nostalgic for a world that never was, right? You think you're taking a cautious step back and in fact you're throwing yourself basically into a kind, into a kind of black hole, into a kind of black hole. The way that all events in the past are gathered up in the politics of eternity is in regularities, in patterns. And the simplest pattern, and it usually really is this, is the pattern of uh, aggression from the outside, penetration from the outside of a, of a virtuous nation which is always in the right, right? In Eastern Europe, this is 
romanticism, right, which, 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 which lives on, which, which lives on. And so the past is all just, it's cycles, right? It's cycles. The same things happen over and over again with different guises, right? We're always attacked from the West. We're always attacked, or from the East, maybe it's from, we're always attacked from the East, right? Um, there are always too many immigrants, whatever it might be. It's, the, it's a pattern, it's a cycle, it's a regularity. And because it's a pattern or a cycle or a regularity, there's no need to try to interpret or explain or to see one event as really any different from any other. And above all, and this is important, no one actually has any responsibility. It's very hard to think about politics in this kind of world. It's very hard to think about leadership. And precisely in this kind of world, the notion of a leader with a capital L, right, um, a duce, a vosge, a führer, a leader with a capital L who comes from outside of history and somehow saves, redeems, rescues the nation or the folk, right, from, from all of this threat from outside. It's in this, it's in the politics of eternity where this notion of a political savior makes, makes sense. Now, once you slip into this way of thinking about time, again, it's like the politics of notability. You don't really need to know anything about the past, not really, because you, it will be explained to you who the enemies always are and how there's regularly a threat. And your experience of time will be of constant threat, of emergency, right? Of the exception as the rule. The exception becomes the rule. The sense of threat, the building that blows up, right? The terrorist attack. This is always happening, or if it isn't always happening, it's always about to happen. Right? It's always about to happen. And in such a world, how can you think about the future? How dare you think about the future when we are under so much pressure right now, when the enemy is always at the gate? How can you imagine reforming the state when the state is there to protect us? Right? How can you even think of that? It's disloyal of you to imagine a future. Right? This is the way the politics of eternity works. There's a wide bandwidth of how this works, right? But at the end of this bandwidth is something called fascism. Now, these are two other ways of thinking about time that are not historical. And the reason why it seems to me so important to be talking about them now is that we could be shifting from one of them to the other. I haven't been particularly happy in the politics of inevitability, right? Um, uh, I don't think that many of you are going to be very happy in the politics of eternity. And the question is how you stop from slipping from one to the other. Because it's very easy, I'm afraid, to go straight from one to the other. It's very easy to go from the view that things are always going to turn out in the end somehow to the view that things are never going to turn out in the end somehow. It's very easy to go from the view of I should cooperate with my elders and authorities because they've told me the truth about how things are always going to get better to I should cooperate with my elders and the authorities because I don't have any other idea of what I should do with my life, right? Things that are patterns of mind and behavior which are very similar from inevitability can slip into eternity, right? And this is, this is, my, this is my concern about you, about all of us, but in particular about you. So um, any historical thought that you have any effort that you make to think historically, any engagement with history is itself um, a sort of resistance to this. Insofar as you're thinking historically, you are inoculating yourself against both of these timescapes. Whether you realize it or not, you're, you're, you're creating a little moment, you're, you're, you're creating time. You're producing, you're producing time, you're producing imagination, you're producing relativism, you're producing thought. Okay, so that's the introduction. Now, what I want to do with the rest is give you a few examples of how the 20th century might be relevant. Why is the introduction so important? Because I don't want to just tell you that here are some lessons from, yes, there are lessons from the 20th century, and the, things, the events I'm going to talk about are, are events in which uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people died, right? It's not that they're insignificant events. But I don't just want to list them as lessons. I want you to see that the stakes of, of taking on history at all are very high. You don't have to agree with all of the lessons, right? And certainly there are other lessons you could draw from other places. I happen to know about Central and Eastern Europe, so that's what I'm going to talk about now. You can draw lessons from other places, but as soon as you're thinking historically, you're already doing a lot for yourself. If you're thinking about history, right, you can draw lessons from 
other things, right? You can, you know, you from 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 Blight, right, or from Gilmore. Um, you can you can draw you can draw lessons about the novelty of American history, right? The notion, for example, that America is an old democracy. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's an old state, but it's only been a democracy in a, in, in the sense that we understand it for about as long as I've been alive which don't hurt my feelings, right? <laughs> it's not that long. It's not that long. And if you do American history, or especially African American history, you can get purchase on this and you can, and you, and you, and you, and you can, and you can see it, right? Civil rights, environmental legislation, let alone, you know, partnership rights and marriage. These are all things that a 70 year old can remember in America without, right? These things are all very new and in that sense in, 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 in flux. Um, but what I, what I want to try to do is contemplate the past using some examples that I know something about, right? That's now the longest I've ever spoke about American history in public, right? <laughs> ever. Um, <laughs> except, except in department meetings, right? Um, so, <laughs> um, and so, and I want to do this in three ways. I'm going to go over the 20th century in, in, in a fairly hasty way, and I'm going to break the 20th century into three parts, which are going to do three things, I hope. The first part is to familiarize Right? The idea being that things that are happening now, although they're not just like things that happened 100 years ago, they're close enough that you can you know, get some purchase, that you can see some similarities and you can feel like you're not entirely um, at lost or, or alone. The, the second part will be about recognition. This will be mostly about the 30s and 40s and the atrocities of the 30s and 40s, the things that one has to watch out for. And the third part will be mostly about the 60s, 70s, and 80s, about communism in Eastern Europe. It will have to do with tactics of resistance. So the third part is recommendations. Okay, familiarization. Familiarization. First point, um, globalizations, they come, they come and they go. They come and they go, all right? They come and they go. Like we, we have this idea that our globalization is special the o I mean, I look at our globalization and I think the thing which is hard about our globalization is that everybody has a stupid screen in front of their face the entire time, which makes it really hard to paint their portrait, right? <laughs> like, have you noticed how hard it is to make somebody look happy holding a smartphone, right? Or even look human, right? Have you noticed how hard advertisers have to struggle to make someone look happy? Right? Like this is like the big advertising marketing struggle of art. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Second embarrassing pop cultural reference. Somebody's going to keep count. Um, but the, our global, the point is, our globalization is not new. There's nothing particularly great about our globalization. The, the one, this is that people count differently. I think this is the second one. Other historians would say there have been others. But the globalization that started in the 1870s was very similar to ours. World trade, vast economic growth, export driven growth. Um, multilingualism, fantastically comparative literature, much better than our own, fantastically comparative poetry, much better than our own, v huge, um, ch huge increases in the pace of technological change, including some really interesting technologies, some of which are arguably superior to the ones we're, we're using now. A sense, a self-conscious sense that globalization was happening. The same kinds of predictions about what globalization would mean, that is the spread of liberalism, um, peace, and later democracy, basically the same consensus in the, in the late 19th century as we had in the late 20th and early 21st century. That's already happened once, okay? And it failed. That doesn't mean it has to fail again. It just means that it was there once and we don't have to feel, if, if our globalization seems to be under threat, which it is, we don't have to feel like, okay, we're in this completely new place, there are no, there are no points of guidance. So similarly, Confidence in globalization, or what I'm going to call liberalism, not in the American sense, but like I mean liberalism in the sense that there are rules that govern things, the very basic sense of liberalism. Um, confidence in liberalism also comes and goes, okay? So the fact that people were very confident in the 90s and in the, what do we call them? The aughts? What do we call the, the zeros? The aughts? Okay. The fact that people were very uh, confident for a while and then they're not confident at all now, that's also not new, right? The same thing happens in the first globalization. People are quite confident about liberalism until right around 1900. And then we have, you know, the beauty of psychoanalysis, expressionism, Balkan Wars, First World War, you know, Great Depression, and it just gets worse after after, after that, right? So uh, liber liberal confidence can come and go. This doesn't mean that 
it ha that it's doomed, right? So if you see that everyone is shaky about the rules that govern things, yeah, they could all go away. That's possible, it's happened, but th it, it, this isn't something new, right? This is not something unprecedented. There's no reason why you have to lose your confidence because there have been reactions. Um, next, the next point, familiarization. Um, to, 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 to do away with ideas of rules around the world, you always or pretty much always appeal to eternity. So this, this thing that I'm talking about, like my, my obsession with losing the sense of time moving forward, and that being replaced suddenly with the sense that time is flat. The re one of the reasons why I'm so preoccupied with that is that that's how it happened the last time, right? There's a light version of this, which begins in Vienna, 1900, where you have the men who are not really rich, pretending to be rich and appealing to the working class, providing alternatives to globalization, which involve protectionism, right? Um, and an odd mix of the old and the new, which of the up and the down, right, as it was famously put by Robert Musil and then by Karl Shorsky, um, which works politically. That's the soft version. The harder versions are fascism with its obsession with Rome, national socialism with, uh, with obsession with a Reich, a thousand year Reich, and above all with this notion that there is no history, only biological regularities, right? Only, only races, inferior, superior, friendly, friendly, and 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 in, an enemy. Um, these are the ways that reactions. These are the reactions that we know come when liberalism shudders. We know that that's important. Final familiarization, right? I'm trying. I'm trying to make the present. Like right? you see how this works. You can make the present less surprising, right? Not that the present is particularly attractive. But you can make it less surprising by looking at very similar events on a large scale, right? The fourth one, inequality matters a lot. So I talk about, I've talked about communism, I've talked about fascism, I'm going to talk about them some more. When we say, when we say fascists, we usually mean something like evil, irrational, mad people, right? When we say communists, we mean... Um, what do we mean? Like evil, irrational, mad intellectuals, I think, is what is usually <laughs> meant, at least in this particular discursive space. And when we make that move, which pretty much every American always makes, at least in mass media, of dismissing them for being mad or wearing spectacles or both, um, <laughs> when we make that move, what we're doing is we're forgetting why those things were attractive, right? And one of the reasons why they were attractive was that the first globalization really did ma bring massive inequality and perceived local inequality, right? Inequality is global, but it also it functions on fractal levels. And how you feel compared to the people who are right around you also matters a great deal, right? So fascism promises that we are going to protect you from the global economy. We're going to make a national economy. We're going to make it bigger by taking more land, right? Communism promises we're going to protect you from, in, from inequality. We're going to look at the poorest, the most miserable. We're going to raise them up by accelerating development, right? These are reactions to inequality. I'm not saying that means that they were, they were good things. I'm just saying that inequality mattered a huge amount in the first globalization, and it matters an awful lot in ours as well. Um, it, it cannot be discarded the way that we'd like to discard it. Okay, that's, rec that's, that's, um, that's familiarization. Recognition. Recognition is about what are some of the things that can go wrong. And you might be saying, well, some things have already gone wrong. Yeah, some things have already gone wrong, and some things went wrong well before the obvious things that went wrong. But, you know, as, as, as my friend and colleague Eli, Eli Stern was saying to me like on the street the other day, um, you know, the lesson of East European history is that you can't say it's not going to get worse. <laughs> <laughs> because at every point, right, in East European history, people have been saying that it's not, it can't get worse, right? And then, and then, it, and then, it, and then it does, or then it did. Okay, so what can you recognize? First, um, the magic of the one-party state, right? What, why are one-party states so magical? What's their special force? Because one-party state is a way of moving from a normal political system with a constitution and elections and so on to one that's less normal, and it can be done gradually, right? So the Nazi takeover of power doesn't just happen overnight with elections, although elections matter. It happens gradually as one party crowds out other parties, as other parties are made illegal, as people get used to a simulacrum of the previous institutions with, in fact, only one party that's allowed to function. Second thing to look out for, to recognize, 
the demonopolization of violence. Okay, that's fancy. So Max Weber had this idea that the state will always aspire to a monopoly on legitimate violence, right? So the policemen should be always be working for the state, right? The army should be part of the state. Something to watch out for is when the state council supports, endorses, funds, trains, groups that are armed are violent that are not really part of the state, that are, that are not, they may wear uniforms, right? They may march in interesting formations, right? They may have ranks and salutes, but they're not part of the state, but they bear arms, right? I'm talking about the SA and, and, and the SS, in case you don't, in case you haven't followed me. Those are, those are, those are demonopolizers of violence. Those are entities which were not part of the normal state, but which the state, which the state supports. And when those things C carry on next to the state, inside the state, start to penetrate the army, start to penetrate the police, they then change the state. This is the second thing to, be, to watch out for. The third thing to watch out for, and if I, like, if I had to choose one of these things for like the bumper sticker, I don't drive very much, so not a bumper sticker, um, for like the sign that you tape to my back, okay. <laughs> if I had to choose one thing for that, it would be Reichstag fire, okay. It would be the politics of emergency, the exception becoming the rule. You ask, you ask, who set the Reichstag? You know what I'm talking, the Reichstag fire, right? A month after Hitler comes to power, the, somebody sets the German parliament on fire. This leads to many important things, the suspension of other political parties, putting lots of people in concentration camps, and the declaration of a state of emergency, which then becomes normal because it's never, it's, it's never lifted, right? That's, that's the Reichstag fire, right? Um, the, the, what the Reichstag fire is important here for us as a landmark is that that's the kind of thing which does away with the way you're thinking about time and politics and freedom now, right? A, a Reichstag fire is the kind of thing which creates a sense of permanent emergency because how, you know, how could they have done this to us? It, it, it creates a new kind of legitimacy for authorities. Maybe they came to power by elections, but it's their reaction to this grand emergency which gives them a new kind of legitimacy, right? Um, and, uh, and, 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 and above all, above all, okay, who set the Reichstag fire? It doesn't matter who set the Reichstag fire, right? There is actually a debate about this still going on, but it doesn't matter who set the Reichstag fire, right? When the Reichstag fire comes again, we may not know who set it, and it's not going to matter too much, right? What's going to matter is how people react to that immediate sense of, oh, nothing like this has ever happened before, right? Which is what everyone always says, even though this happens with numbing regularity, <laughs> right? When it happens again, people are going to say, this has never happened before, hence state of exception, hence emergency, right? And the question is, how do you react to that? If you react to it historically, you think, aha, 1933, there are plenty of other examples, but you think 1933, there are, there's, there's room for maneuver here, there are for possibilities for manipulation. We don't have to go straight into, um, straight into, into, the, in, into flat time, right, into, into eternity. Um, uh, relatedly, watch out for the words terrorism and exceptional, and, and especially extremism. I mean, I'm aware that there is such a thing as terrorism, Right? But I'm also aware that every authoritarian regime in the history of modern politics talks about terrorism all the time. And extremism, what is that exactly? Right? We've got, so like we've gotten used to saying terrorism, extremism, or at least hearing it, I hope you're not saying it, terrorism, extremist, terrorists and extremists. What, I is there an actual extremist doctrine? Right? Um, I mean, I consider myself an extremist when it comes to the defense of things that I think are truly important, and I hope other people would consider that. I, I mean, I don't think like, oh, U.S. Constitution, you know, it's about the same, you know, Skittles, you know, I, it's not, it's not all the same to me, right? So in that sense, because it's not all the same to me, I am an extremist, and I hope that all of you are as well. You don't have to have the same values, but I hope that you have some, okay? Um, I hope there's something that you feel extremely about, and if you, if you, there is, then you're an extremist, right? And we're all extremists, and you know, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, Right? Um, so watch out for that because extremism ends up just meaning what's not in the mainstream, where the mainstream is the thing which the leaders have just defined as being the mainstream a day ago or a moment ago or in the same sentence perhaps. Recognition, the personification of globalization. Okay, so globalization is real, it's difficult, it's problematic, we all have to deal with it. 
what leaders do, what in particular Adolf Hitler did, was to personify it. It's not a set of impersonal forces, it's not a challenge, it's not a difficulty, it's the Jews. Right? And uh, that's not just theory, it's also practice. You, you, s you say that a Jew is not a person, not your neighbor, not a citizen of Germany, but a member of Weltjudentum, of world Jewry. Right? You literally globalize that person and you, and you put all the negative aspects of globalization inside that person. And that's a form of politics because that, that extrudes the person from the apartment building, the local community, the school, eventually the country, and all of the people who are not globalized in this way pitch in by taking the property, taking the place in school, taking whatever it is, and they get involved in, in, in that way, right? Um, okay, fifth thing, um, the suspended state. Watch out for this. Watch out for people who say the state's not important, that all we have to do is disrupt the state, it would be cool to destroy the state and see what happens. Next, plenty of guilty parties, a long list of American politicians and, um, you know, on both the left and the right who have ideas like this. One of them is now, you know, the chief policy advisor in the White House. Um, to have a great terror in the Soviet Union, you have to suspend, even in the Soviet Union, you have to defend the state. You have to, sorry, you have to suspend the state. You have to declare a state of emergency. Even in Nazi Germany, to carry out a Holocaust, they don't do it in their own country. They can't. It's too much of a rule of law state. Nazi Germany is too much of a rule of law state, despite everything. They do it in places where they have invaded and destroyed the state and declared the state doesn't exist. So watch out for people who th tell you that the state is just kind of an artifact, right? I mean, the state, like uh, all the other things I'm talking about, has its problems, but you can't have the rule of law without it. <laughs> um, just try, right? Just try. That's what the 1930s were, people who lost the rule of law because they lost the state. Okay, so um, this brings me to the, the last set of things I wanted, I wanted to talk to you about, which is recommendations. Now, if I were a West, this is the move which I make when I become a West Europeanist. If I were a West Europeanist, <laughs> I would say there were two big lessons of the Second World War, two big lessons of the 20th century. Um, the first would be that the, you can repair this thing I'm calling liberalism, a liberal order, by way of uh, by way of economic policy, right? You can have monetarism. You can have you can have you can you can spend, right? You can deficit spend. You can make sure that you have free trade regionally. Like these are practical lessons, and they're and they're, and they're true, and 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 they're and they're and they're really important. Um, you, you, a second lesson of the Second World War, like West Europeans would say, would be, and it's also true, would be, um, yeah, nation states have problems, therefore they should work together. Okay, I'll just make, leave it at that level of banality. Um, Poland might not be functional, Portugal might not be functional, but all of them together in a free trade zone, in, in, in a single economy, right? That happens to be the largest economy in the history of the world with a much higher standard of living than the United States. It's a bigger economy than China's still, right? I realize you don't like turn, open your newspaper and you get the headline, European Union great, right? <laughs> You don't get that headline, which is, it's funny, right? Because, you know, it's pretty great. It's a bigger economy than ours, better transparency, lower rates of corruption, higher reported happiness, right? And all we get is when things blow up. But anyway, I'll just leave that as an aside. Um, so those would be the West European lessons, and I think they're true, and I don't want to disregard them. But what I want to concentrate on is the way that East Europeans, who had a long stretch under communism, rethought liberal and democratic theory and the things which, which they added which are, which are useful and interesting. Um, one of them is, I've already mentioned, is extreme care with the language, right? Uh, East Europeans faced with communism realized that language, turning individuals into members of groups, turning groups into inevitable historical trends, drawing policy conclusions on the basis of that, right? That the first step, the use of language is extremely important and therefore when they opposed the first step that they made when they opposed was to think try to think of a different kind of set of words it seems very simple but try to use different different words and um, you know this is this is Orwell's preoccupation um, and of course to, in order to be able to do this you have to read books because if you just watch, I mean, I'm sorry to sound like even older than I am but if you just watch television or if you just follow your own goddamned Facebook feed, you get the same words over and over and over again and they start to speak through you, 
right? They start to speak through you, which you can say in Slavic languages, right? But you can't say anyways. They start to speak through you, rather than you choosing the words you use yourself. And how are you going to have those words? You're going to read. Um, you know, you're going to read Orwell above all, I think, on this particular on this particular issue. Second thing, concern with factuality, right? So when you're faced with um, when you're faced with the politics of inevitability or the politics of, of eternity, what's what's the, what's a move that you make? A move that you make is that you try to rescue the individual fact from the big story, right? Whether it's a story of progress or whether it's a story of eternal victimhood, right? You try to rescue the individual fact. You try to make the individual facts your own. At this point, inevitably arises the question, what is truth, right? I'm going to go back to my original Matrix reference. What, what, is, what is truth? Which I'm, no, I'm not going to solve for you guys here today, but I, I'm going to say the following. I mean it earnestly. If what is truth, that question, if that's, you know, that can be a pose and that can be an excuse for doing nothing, or it can be a search. <laughs> and I earnestly recommend that it be the latter, that it be, that it be a search, as it was for the East European dissidents of the 1970s. Next, um, next, next recommendation would be watching out for conformism. Okay, this one is hard. I mean, I don't mean to hit home too hard here, so I won't, but I mean, you guys know you're guilty, right? So, I mean, yeah, right? No, you don't think because you dress differently and stuff? Okay, I'll give it to you. Um, uh, yeah, right? Wake up if you're around awake. So, the conformism. You watch out for conformism. And, and how do you know when you're being a conformist? When you don't feel awkward all the time. Because the people who stand out always feel awkward. Freedom feels awkward. And the, mo the moments where freedom is actually at stake, by which I mean now for you guys, are the moments when people have to feel awkward. Now, what, what's conformism? Okay, it sounds bad. Everything I put an ism on is going to sound bad. I'm, I'm making the mistake. I, 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 you know, what's conformism? Who's a conformist? Who would say I'm a conformist? Nobody. It's not an ideology. Okay, what's conformism? Self-censorship is conformism. You know, when you don't write down the things or say the things you might otherwise say. And self-censorship is, is, a, is a species of a larger problem, which is called anticipatory obedience. When you obey in advance, when you use your precious creativity um, and your hard-fought social skills to think, so no, it's normal, right, to be creative and think about what should I do, but to be creative about what somebody else is going to want for you, from you, right? It's a subtle move, but it's profoundly important. It's normal to use your social skills to think, oh, what does the other person want? I should start with them, not with me. That's great, right? But it's, it, it's, it's a different thing, subtly, profoundly different to say, okay, what does power want? I'm going to meet power halfway. I'm going to do advance. When you harness your own creativity, like those are things which could be serving your own individual, let's say, freedom. When those things are harnessed for obedience in advance, you are doing the work of power for it. <laughs> Right? And that is about 90% of how authoritarianism works, right there. So when I say conformism, it isn't just like you're all going to like march, you know, it's not like a, it's, I don't mean like in a commercial where like you just march down. And you, I mean conformism in that you use your individual gifts, right, of which you were, you know, fortunate to have so many. You use your individual gifts to think about how you can move yourself, your future towards what power wants. This is what usually happens. It ought not to happen. A uh, couple more. Civil society, right? Civil society. Recognize that all the modern authoritarianisms, including the ones that are working right now, are allergic on this question of civil society. That is, of groups that are neither individuals nor the government. The easiest way to rule is it for it to be the government and a bunch of atoms, right? Atoms, individual, moral, people who are morally and psychologically isolated. That's an easy ruling situation. If you have civil society, that is, if you have people who are doing things together, which are not, they don't have to be political things, right? They can be anything, really. But people doing things together that are neither for nor against the government, that creates connections, it creates professional ethics, it works against atomization, right? It creates confidence, it may create something which is extremely important, which is trust. If nobody trusts anybody, authoritarianism is really easy. If, if some groups trust other groups, authoritarianism becomes much harder. Because if nobody trusts anybody, right, then, you know, then all there's left is power. If nobody trusts anybody, resistance, if necessary, becomes totally impossible. Because you cannot, you cannot resist all by yourself. You have, to, you have to be able to trust someone. You have to have that particular attitude. And civil society also creates authority, like in the sense of 
journalistic authority, right, in the sense of trusting not just individuals, but maybe some institutions, right? That there are, there are, co there are collectivities out there that aren't the state, but that you might trust, for example, for, for information. Okay. Um, final, okay, a couple, okay, I'll just give you one more. The way that communism ends had to do with, with people trusting one another, not just in individual civil societies, but with people sharing reflections across countries. In the United States, we are not alone now, right? The things that have happened to us in the last year, I mean, for me, it's like a nightmare because basically, like everything that happens in Ukraine now happens in America, but just with less style, right? <laughs> and, and everyone is just, is like much slower to react to it, which makes me crazy, right? You know, my Ukrainian friends are constantly, like a Ukrainian, like a Ukrainian journalist shows up and just like sniffs the air in Ohio and says, yeah, he's gonna take the state, right? And she's right. <laughs> <laughs> and she's right, right? I, you know, and, and this is the this is what's happened in the world a little bit is that I mean I'm not just talking about the so-called West but things that happened in Russia and Ukraine you know we for a while things that happened here then happened there okay but now things that happen there happen here basically if you have to generalize but the point is that y it's good to have Hungarian friends um, not just for the cooking it's good to have Hungarian friends because they can tell you what it looks like when a rule of law state is step by step demolished without actually breaking the law or coming close to not breaking the law, right? It's good to have Russian friends because they can tell you what really slick, effective, state-sponsored, high production value television propaganda looks like, feels like, how it, how it works, and so on and so on and so on, right? We're not actually alone in, in, in this. We've just joined a much, larger, a much larger trend. Now, the final thing I wanna say about examples. Um, the notion of a failed transition, okay, so, Back in 1989, when we were entering into this, mom this, this moment of politics of inevitability, which is now over, which is now over, um, when we were entering into this moment, people talked about transitions, which is always a teleological concept, right? Because a transition assumes that you know what's at the end of something. There's a process, but you also know what's going to happen, right? And so if there's a transition, the transition was to democracy or capitalism, right? If there's a transition, then you, you, there are only two possibilities. There's a successful transition, there's a failed transition. And if you're thinking that way, you look at a place like Ukraine or a place like Russia and you say, oh, failed transition. It's therefore irrelevant, right? Um, it's therefore, as President Obama very unfortunately in my view said, it's therefore just a, a, a regional power, right? You know, and this is the whole way that we thought about Eastern Europe, unfortunately, in the Obama administration, that, well, there are general rules and the general rules have to do with people being enlightened and rational and wanting economic growth. And so in the long run, in the long run, there shouldn't be wars in, in Europe or invasions. That shouldn't be happening, right? So let's bracket it because eventually history will come to the rescue. No, 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 it never comes to the rescue, right? Um, the, Russia and Ukraine and other places, Hungary, Poland, if you want, these are not failed transitions. These are, these, are, these are interesting political systems run by very intelligent people who are playing by different rules, many of whom think that their rules have to spread westward for them to maintain power at home. It's not that they've like fallen off the mainstream, right? And therefore you can ignore them. They are doing something different. And the thing that they are doing is catching on here too, right? So the, the, the point of all this is, is to say that like for good, for good and for ill, um, we, are, we are all in this together. Oh, Ukraine, okay. There's, a, there's an interesting Ukrainian model, which I just wanna share with you. So let's say that you're a kind of like make-believe oligarch. It, it, not me. I'm always happy when it's not me. Um, the, uh, the, the, let's, let's say that you're like a, a, a baby oligarch, right? You're like, you're a make-believe oligarch. You want people to think you're an oligarch. You're not really an oligarch, but it's kind of like your thing to be an oligarch, right? <laughs> like that's your thing, like gold, flashiness, like lots of, you know, lots of sort of 80s era bling. Um, you know, like, like your restaurants have sliders, you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> um, let's say you're that, right? Um, and like you really want your kids to be really rich, you know, like that's, if you have another thing, it's that, you want your kids. And then let's say, you know, you succeed in breaking down um, what there is of the rule of law. You succeed in becoming the biggest oligarch in the country, right? It's not that you love Russia particularly, but Russia will help you out in this particular direction. It's not that even you don't like democracy. It's just that democracy can sometimes get in the way of this project of making your son unbelievably wealthy, right? That's Ukraine under Yanukovych, more or less. I mean, that's, that more or less 
just happened. One doesn't have to, I'm trying to say, one doesn't have to reach all the way back to the 30s and 40s. And one doesn't have to have just the most dire examples to see things which might be happening. Oh, let's say your political advisor is Paul Manafort, right? I mean, it just goes on. These resemblances just go on and on and on. We've become very Ukrainian without knowing, you know, without knowing what that means. Uh, except, you know, all of you, of course, know what it means. Well, unfortunately, you only know what it means up to about 1912 at this point, right? <laughs> so I need you in the second semester of the class. <laughs> okay, so fine. Okay, the end, the end. What does, this, what does this mean for you? Okay, you, you, know, you know what my basic point is. My basic point is that where you have been, where you have spent your lives up to now, and you can, like, you can riot later, but where you have, no, in fact, I want you to riot later, right? That's the point. Like, I'm giving you permission to riot later. Riot later, not while the camera's on, but later. Um, the, um, <laughs> no, because if you do it when the camera's on, then everybody on the YouTube video will just, like, they'll just, like, go down to the riot part. They'll be like, <laughs> you know, the email's like, riot is at 43 minutes, 22 seconds. And everybody's like, <laughs> right? And then no one will listen to my lecture. So don't write. So later, later. Okay. So, W where, where, where you, you know my main point, that the politics of inevitability is where you've been. It's how we've, how we've raised you, unfortunately, right? That's completely unbelievable now, and I hope you understand, but that's sort of been the mistake I think the previous generation has made with yours, and it's a very powerful mistake, and it's a, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very risky gambit, and now it hasn't worked. The politics of eternity is where you might be going, right? It's where you might be going. It's fairly easy. It's fairly easy to get there. And the question then becomes how we think about wh what this is right now, right? Is it a turning point? Like the notion of a turning point is very passive. It's geometrical, you know, mathematical. You know, are we really, are we really in geometry? You know, is, is all this going to, is like the, you know, the, the, the suffocated time of inevitability, is it going to become the starved time of, of eternity? Or can you build out a moment? right, from this turning point? Can you build out a moment for yourselves? Can you produce time? Like, can you see time? Can you produce time? Can you make this thing, which is the now, become a kind of moment, right, which is special like all moments are, different like all moments are, but also in some sense not different, also understandable in reference to things that you know about or could know about from, from the past. Now, this, this business of creating time, I don't mean it metaphorically. I mean, time is a precondition to political action. It's a precondition to freedom. What inevitability and eternity do in different ways, in the different degrees, they take away, they take away time. Now, and you also know that I think that some of the things that go on, some of the ways that the culture functions are going to make it, some of the things that you do, okay, let me give you agency, make it, or make it relatively easy to slide from inevitability to eternity, right? This whole notion of disruption, which I mentioned earlier, right? That's very sexy when you think that everything's inevitable and like if you can disrupt as much as you want, it's still going to bounce back. It isn't going to bounce back. It's over, right? It's not gonna there's nothing to bounce back. There's nothing to bounce back. Um, Post-catastrophism, po post right? I mean, all of the films that, you know, you may not consume, but which I, I, I'm aware of and maybe I sometimes watch, like all of the films where there is no state and there is, in, there is no state, there are no rules, everyone's just fighting for resources. That's a problem mentally, right? Because the, the, you, jump, you jump all the, the games, right? Which I just know you don't play late at night on huge screens in basements. I know you don't play these games, but so let me describe them to you. They're post-catastrophic, right? Whether there's a catastrophe or not is the important question. Like what post-catastrophism looks like, that's a leap ahead, right? But the thing to think about is, is how to stop the catastrophe from actually happening, right? To take, to take a certain amount of, of responsibility because that's what history, I think, means. A certain amount of responsibility, not all of it, you know, God forbid, but a certain amount of responsibility. If you see that there are structures, but those structures can be moved a, a, a little bit, then you have a certain, like the moment you realize that, then you have a certain amount of responsibility. Not a lot, but everyone, but everyone has, everyone has a little. So this is what, you know, this is what, um, I, I, this is why, you know, I think of you, and I really do, right? I'm, and and it, like, I'm not like when, when I lecture, you're not all in my class, and that's cool. I like that. So forgive me the references. As you, but when you come to class on, on Tuesday or whenever it is, I'm not going to be this nice, so just like soak it up right now. I think like you have a chance to be a historical generation, right? You have a chance to be a historical generation. You can make this time historical time. You have a chance, and it's, I mean it in two senses, right? Like you could be important, but also you could be the generation which gets people thinking 
historically again, right, in the sense of, of generating possibility, of, of, of generating, you know, of generating connections. Now, that's the, that's, that's the nice part. Here comes the, here comes the not nice part. I think you will be, you will be, I mean, you know, who, I'm being all prophetic, I could be totally wrong, but it, 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 you will be remembered, I think, right, as, as, a, as a historical generation or not at all, <laughs> or not at all. Because if we slide into eternity in a soft version or a hard version, then you just don't matter, right? Then you just don't matter. You're not even a bump in the road, right? Because it's not even a road. It's just flat asphalt and desert out to an empty horizon forever, right? So you, I think you will be, a hist I think you can be, I think you can be, I think you will be a historical generation. But if you don't generate history, history's not going to remember you as, as a generation, right? So, you know, Millennial can be something that repeats or it can be nothing at all. I don't know yet, right? You, you guys are going to, you're going to, you're going to tell me. Okay. Um, I'm going to end with, I'm going to end with Hamlet because I just read it and it's on my list of things that everyone should read right now. It's actually, it's really wonderful in these particular times. But one of Hamlet's early soliloquies, he, he ends with, um, the time is out of joint, uh, oh cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. That's where you are, right? That's where you are. The time is out of joint. We're not in inevitability anymore. We're not in eternity yet. It's floating, right? You could build out moments. I don't know if you will. I don't know if we will, but it could happen. Things are out of joint. They're going to fall back into some pattern or another soon, but right now they're, they're out of joint. Now, Hamlet, one thing, you, one reason to read Hamlet is that it goes very badly for Hamlet, right? <laughs> it goes terribly for Hamlet. It goes terribly for, I'm not saying everything's going to go well, you know? I mean, as many of you know, I think things could go extraordinarily badly, right? Things go very badly for Hamlet, for the court, for his friends, for, for Denmark in the story. But in the beginning, in the beginning is where we are, what he actually says is, time is out of joint, no cursed spite that ever I was born to put it right. And then the last line says, nay come, let's go together. Right? And you can, you can, and I hope you will. That's it. Thank you. All, 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 all historians are aspiring. <laughs> Okay, so let me start with 1914, 2014, because that, that's an example, that's an example of, um, uh, that's a little tiny example of, of politics of eternity creeping in, people don't even notice. So there's a war in Ukraine in 2014, but it's the centennial of 1914. And so the metaphor that everyone uses, to use your word metaphor, that, that when people talk about Ukraine in 2014, like they're constantly thinking about 1914 and they can't help it because it's been the centennial, right? The memory, the commemoration, all these things which aren't actually history, those things are in everyone's mind, right? And so the, 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 the idiotic shamanistic accident <coughs> 
that one war is 100 years after another has true, histor has true historical consequences, right? I'm against that, okay? And I'm also against, I'm also against the notion that there's an alternative which like our language forces us into one way or the other. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to demonstrate or I'm trying to use language in a different way. When I talk about Hitler, I'm neither saying that it's inevitable that we have Reichstag fire, blah, 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 nor am I saying our institutions are better than the Germans, therefore. That's exactly what I'm not doing. I'm trying to do something, I'm trying to say, in history, including in Nazi Germany, which is just, it's history, it's history like other history, there are certain patterns, there are certain things that go together and certain things that don't go together, right? Um, and I, I, I'm not at all saying, I hope I was very clear about this, that we're in some kind of deterministic path, right? The very notion that we're in a deterministic path is the thing that I'm trying to, to fight against, I hope clearly. What I'm trying to say instead is that if we have a sense of things that are a little bit like and a little bit unlike, we then have a wider horizon of possibility in terms of what we think could happen in the US, right? Because I think more things are possible here than people generally realize, but also a wider sense of possibility in how we might react, right? So if we know, it's like, I, I'm saying Reichstag fire, I'm not saying that therefore inevitably there will be a discussion about it, whether a Dutch anarchist did it, you know, no, you know, I, I'm not saying anything inevitably. I'm saying if there was a similar event, like, so, you know, skip to 9-11. A lot of the ways that we reacted to 9-11 were, you know, politics of emergency, never happened before and so on. When we get the next 9-11, do, do we choose to react the same way or do we choose to react in a different way? Talking about the, I don't, when I talk about the Rex Talk fire, for me it's not a metaphor, right? For me it's a fire, right? Um, for me it's a, it's a set of events which I feel like I more or less understand. For me it's a moment which I think that other people could also imbibe as a moment, which is why, you know, for me history is moments and the more moments you have, the better chance you have, right? This, it's, it's, some, it's something like that. So, like, I, I can't engage at the level you want me to because I'm against the whole, I'm against the whole step back to this is discourse and I'm against the whole step back to this is metaphor. I'm just against those things now. I don't, honestly don't think we have time for them, right? Nazi Germany is blazingly relevant. We can, we can agree, we can talk about why or, or, or why not, but what I won't do is say, okay, I'm gonna talk about the appropriateness of it. I'm just not, right? I think we're past that, right? I, I'll, I'll be calmer now. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I mean, you're, you're there, that's, 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 that's tough. So, I mean, let me, let me start a little bit with one of your premises, mm -hmm. the election, like we all, like, th what you describe is part of the issue, right? Th there was a certain lack of clarity about what people were for, mm -hmm. especially on some of the most fundamental issues and the way that the Clinton campaign went for it, especially at the end, with what we were against, Right. I mean, when I when I when I was when I was in the Midwest and watching those ads, I, they felt differently to me than the, than, than than here. You know, the, the you know we can't trust him with the nuclear codes and that kind of thing. That, a lot of that turned out to be advertising for Trump, for Trump, in the end. Right. So, like, just knowing what you're against isn't the same. It's not. It's not actually a logical problem. Where if you know what you're against, therefore you know what you're for. And there was an issue there. And I think with the Democrats there is an issue. Not, I mean, I don't mean that in a personal way. 
Um, but I mean, it's like it's this problem of boredom that arises from politics of inevitability because with you know, both Clinton and Obama, and with all the appropriate qualifications and with all the differences, they're representing a party which is the, we're the status quo, we're gonna stop the mad people from gaining power party, right? That's the Democrats in the US. They're like the Espa, you know, they're like, they're like the Espada, the Twatties. They're the party which says like, if you have to vote for us because otherwise it's gonna be a disaster, basically. That always loses. It always loses. I mean, it might win once or twice, but it always loses in the end because people do not, understandably, do not think that that's a sensible way of understanding the future of, of their lives, right? So th th this is a little bit of the problem. Now, what this thing is, okay, I'm gonna take, I'll give you the easy answer and then I'll, tr then I'll negotiate with the hard part. The easy answer is, of course, there's no like two minute way of saying it. There isn't a two minute way of saying it. And part, like, par par part of the way that both inevitability and especially eternity work is chopping everything up into small bits, right? So like if you want to, like if, you, know, you, know, you don't have to admit you're doing this, but if you want, it doesn't even matter if it's MSNBC or, or, or CNN or, or, or Fox, right? You could, if you watch any of them, they break up what's happening into such small bits that nothing ever happens, right? Mitt Romney ties his shoelace. Mitt Romney takes a step towards restaurant in New York. Mitt Romney lifts a fork, right? Mitt Romney has first course. Donald Trump raises fork, you know, like every like it's like pixel by pixel, you know, like and, and so nothing ever actually happens. Every story is developing. There's no developed story heading, right? Every story is always developing and nothing ever actually happens in the end. And so my point is that like we have to, I think we do, I mean I hate to sound like a cranky old historian, which I am, but we have to get away a little bit from the I gotta be able to do it in I mean, I do things in 108 characters all the time, or however many characters it is, and not without assistance. But, 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 um, but, 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 like, we have to get away a little bit from the we can solve it that way because we can't, right? Like the, 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 you know, the, the long, the long form journalism, right? The attention span. That's part of some of the things that I'm talking about, especially the factuality bits. Um, you can't get to fact to fact to factuality without like longer longer exposure, longer attention spans, a very self-conscious you know, approach, to, approach to print, I think. Um, okay, that's the easy way out. The, the, the harder part is, you know, I, I can't, so, so there, at one level, like what I'm trying to say is that any engagement with history, whether it's like Native American history, which you know, is, is, I, I find increasingly interesting, you know, or, 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 or African American history, or especially any history that's not your own, right? Like that's kind of support important to all of this. But engagement with a history that's not your history, any engagement of that sort is political in the way that I'm describing because it builds out the possibility of politics, right? Politics requires time and somebody has to produce that time, right? And people who think historically are producers of time as opposed to consumers, which other people are, right? And I'm, again, I'm like that, it's, so, it's something like that. Exactly what ideas you're working for or like what kind of future you see, I, you know, I, I don't know and I'm not gonna give you that. I'm not, I'm not gonna stand here and give you that. What I am gonna say is that it, just mechanically, in order for there to be a future like that's rich in possibility, there also has to be a past which is rich in possibility, right? And, that, and to have that past, you have to ha there has to be something like history. So, you know, it, and look, I'm not trying to solve everything with this lecture either, you know? I'm try I, I, as a historian, like, these are, I think these are things like we can do to recognize patterns and try to head them off, like that's the, that's the catastrophe part, you know, and to, to, to learn what one can do when very bad things happen, and then also to, to get, get a certain toolbox, right? That's already going pretty far. I, I, can't, I can't go much farther than that. Okay, anything else? Oh, who's there? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so yeah, I, 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 I'll give you some very general, because like if you've taken a class in U.S. history, you're already you know way ahead of me in terms of actual knowledge. But I mean, at a, at a uh, no, really, it's been a while, and a lot of stuff has happened in the meantime. Um, but like the, the 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 federal system, I think it's an excellent point. And when you know, and when people, and when we talk about like the appropriateness of some of the analogies I'm making, it's a very important point because one of the things that happens in the 20s and 30s, and so the Germans in the 20s and 30s had a lot of things that we have, right? They had an educated population, they had export led, you know, they had export led growth. Um, they probably, you know, they had better manners and longer attention spans. You know, they had a lot of things we had, and and uh, it's nodding with the attention spans somehow here, and um, a, 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 but they also had the rule of law, and they were they were they were obsessed with the rule of law, and they had a federal they had a federal system, right? And so you 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 watch those things can go away is my point, right? So the rule of law can be changed from the inside. Um, and and the, the, you can unify, so pol I'll give you the example of the police, right? So the police in the United States are sort of, you know, beautifully, spectacularly decentralized. Um, in Germany, they were fairly decentralized at the beginning, but they found a way to create command structures which slowly embraced not only all the police at a central level, but also the police plus the SS by, by the end. You know, by, by, by the end, or you know, by the, around the time the war started, that had all been worked out into one pyramid. So that's something I would watch I would be very alert for. Like I gave the example of watch out for the sort of the paramilitaries, the guys with uniforms who march in strange formations and sort of are in the state and not in it, right? Which in the US of today is like, it's a question of like, what, what, do you, what there's so many guns, right? And there are so many various kinds of paramilitaries. The, so for in our context, it's like, if that starts to seem less disorganized and less anti-system and suddenly is pro-system and more organized, I'd watch out for that. But the other example, like with the federal, with the federal system would be, d d does the center try to get all the organs of power in, into some kind of pyramid, right? I would, I would very much watch out for that. That's about as far as I can go. I mean, I'm ge I generally tend to think that the states are a very useful, like at this particular moment, they're a very useful barrier. <laughs> Right, when you, you know, I, I don't know where you're from, but like some of my family's in California, and like from there, of course, the whole thing looks different. <laughs> if you're in a big economy, you know, with like, with police forces, which you don't think are likely to do certain things, the whole situation might look different than if you're in a little state like, like Connecticut. Right. Yeah, like whether the, I mean, I tend to think the blue state should make the utopias, if that's, because it, 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 shows, it shows what's possible. It expands the horizon. Of, I mean, not that they're actually utopias, right? I mean, but you know, I tend to think that that like the state, like you know, that, that states do things, and then and then some of those things turn out not to be disasters, and then they become totally normal, right? The example of like of um, of partnership, right, or you know, marriage equality, like Massachusetts, whoever does it, and then it turns out not to end the world, and that removes one of the big arguments against it that it was going to end the end the world, right? And then it kind of becomes boring because you know for Americans it's either in the world or it's boring, right? And so, <laughs> so it kind of became boring. Anyway, I tend to think that they should, be, they should be laboratories of policies because it shows what's possible, but that's about as far as I can go with that. Yeah, I mean, in my negative mindset, it's really like the, pol it's the police that I, that I think about the most. You know, so when I think about Germany, right, it goes back to Max's question, you know, I think about like the police in, in Bremen who were, you know, one day, and Bremen's a nice town, you know, one day they were directing traffic literally, and like three days later, they were in Kiev rounding people up to be shot at Babi Yar with no particular training, nothing in particular, right? There were people who were trained, there were people who were ideologically motivated, not these guys particularly, but they did it. <laughs> they were all part of one command structure, and then once you got them into an unfamiliar situation, conformism kicks in, and then once they've done it, they've done it, and they can't go back from having done it, and they do it again. So like it's, it's, the, it's the police that like, the, the, the fact that America's p police power is split up in all these kinds of ways, which I find interesting. Okay, I think I think the 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 the, the Vox Populi is uh, is saying that we've used up our time. So maybe one more question. Okay, yeah. You know, Eastern and Central Europe. Well, what do these people tell you about the election of Trump? What do you think will be changing for them with the election of Trump in that part of Europe? Oh well, so the first thing I would say is that. It was people who work on Eastern Europe, whether they were East Europeans themselves or just students of East European politics, who tended to think that something like Trump was possible. Um, because, you know, because um, 
these these things partly because like if you're an East European, you have just a broader sense of what's possible. This is one of the things that Czesław Miłosz says with particular ruthlessness about the about the Americans or about the West. That like we I think he uses the phrase childishly naive, but the, the, the idea that be, because things haven't happened to us, they're just not in our imaginary. Um, and, and therefore, we don't know how to react to like the most fundamental things that can happen. Like, for example, that one day there are corpses on the street. You know, that's just part of life. That one day there are corpses on the street, and the Americans have no notion of what you know. So, East Europe, East, being in Eastern Europe, at least until very recently, involved having this broader notion of what the possible was. But the other, the other thing is, of course, that there are very few things in the Trump phenomenon which are not present in some form or other in Russia, Ukraine, Hungary, or or, or Poland. Right? I mean, each of these, like, it's just sort of, kind of it's one more case which has a family resemblance to, to the other cases. And those cases just happened to come, to come first. So people were less surprised, right? I mean, in, in Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, there was, there was much more like, he's a joke, it can't, right, right down to the last minute, he's a joke, it can't happen, you know. Um, how do they think about it? It depends who. It depends who. I mean, the people who, uh, who, 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 who believe that their, um, their future and or, or the, their way of living or even their life depends upon some kind of Atlantic cooperation, you know, whether it's NATO or whether it's a European Union, which has the Americans as a friendly outsider, those people are very concerned, of course, right? Very concerned that this is the first American president who, um, who, 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 who sees the EU and NATO as being sort of superficial, irrelevant, they should pay their own way. That's never happened before. Those people are very concerned. And you know, even like, and, and, and the, the notion of a European army or European structures, like that conversation has moved forward very quickly <laughs> in the last few, few weeks, few weeks and months. Um, some people, of course, are, are just are, are in utter despair because this goes back to the thing I was saying about like international models. It really does matter what happens more than we realize. You know, it, it, that things become plausible, things are plausible or implausible depending on what happens in other countries, right? So this was th that you would lose the U.S. as a model, right? Which of course, is, I mean, let's not like let's not you know for all the like for all the liberals for all the U.S. is gone as a model now, right? Just I mean, it's gone. Just like Poland is gone for Ukraine, it's gone. It's gone. It's over. Um, it's a mo I mean, it, it, it's, it's many things, it's important, you try to work with it and so on, but the notion that this is actually like a, 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 some kind of, you know, ideal democracy, that's, you know, that's gone. Um, it was, I mean, it was, a lot of it was gone even before the election actually happened um, because of the style of the election and other things, but so yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's quite significant. And people, it's harder for people to live without models. Right. So in the next in the next few months, I think a lot of what's going to be interesting to see is how much the Europeans actually managed to come up with a European. Not so it's like anti-Americanism was always kind of a luxury, like because America was there. Like you can be as Amer anti-American as you want, you know, because America's there. Right. It's a version of this like disruption thing. Like sure, you can be anti-American because they're here anyway. Right. Now that America is not there, at least morally, and might not be there politically and militarily, might not. Then anti-Americanism is suddenly irrelevant. <laughs> Right? It's gone, basically, because no one has time for it. It's irrelevant. What you now have to do is sort of non-Americanism. Right? You have to think of how you might manage these things without, without the Americans. So, you know, that's, that's, that's my basic sense. But I mean, like, there's a positive side to this as well, which I've been feeling for months, which is that my friendships in Eastern Europe are, you know, more resonant than they ever were. <laughs> because these people are able to predict things that are going to happen in my country with, like, fantastic perspicacity. Okay, the, the, I think the, the, the dominant mood is that we've, this has been going on long enough. Yeah, so thank you very much for coming. Thanks for talking. Thanks.